So this talk is basically recounting my experience working at Cruise as an ML infrastructure engineer uh, and all of the learnings that I got from there. So uh, I'm not at Cruise anymore. Uh, I left about a year and a half ago. Now I'm founder uh, and CEO of a company called Sematic that essentially builds open source MLOps tools. So just a quick background about myself. Uh, I'm originally from France. I started my career in a different industry, not even industry, in academia actually, uh, doing particle physics research. Uh, then I moved to the US, worked at Instacart for four years, then Cruise for four years, and then I started my own company uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so that, that's the idea. So when I joined Cruise, um, after Instacart, I was pretty excited to join a, a robot taxi company. I thought I would enter sort of the greatest, uh, the, the best and greatest infrastructure on earth around machine learning. Turns out it wasn't really the case. And the reason for that is that uh, they did obviously have some models running on the car for object detection, tracking, and, and so on. But uh, many of the behaviors uh, of the car on the road were still dictated by algorithms and, and heuristics uh, as opposed to machine learning models. So the handful of models that were on the car uh, were trained on local machines or local GPU machines uh, lying around the office. Uh, data sets were stored on hard drives uh, that you, know, you didn't even know where they were. Um, and models were trained once, uh, six months ago, and then uh, we don't really know how to retrain it. So, you know, pretty messy setup. Um, and so that's when uh, we saw an opportunity to start a machine learning infrastructure team. Um, it was called Machine Learning Platform at the time. And the idea was that we wanted to make all of this more repeatable, more traceable, uh, more professional, essentially. Uh, and so we started working on a number of different things. The, the first thing that we tried to address was access to data. As I mentioned, uh, data sets were kind of spread around, some on hard drives, some on S3 buckets, uh, some in databases. And it was very hard for ML teams to access th those data sets. And so they would spend most of their time foraging for data and making sure that they had the right data sets, updating the data set with the latest label data. And all of this was very manual and uh, was kind of a waste of their time. So uh, in 2018, uh, we introduced a new um, data processing framework internally uh, called Terra. It was basically a wrapper around Apache Beam. So I don't know if anybody has, has heard of uh, Apache Beam, but uh, it's essentially an SDK to uh, describe data pipelines. So similar to Spark, if you will, but a lot more usable. Uh, and it basically is the front end or the, the, the code, uh, the SDK for the um, uh, Google Dataflow product. Uh, so Google Dataflow is a hosted data processing pipeline uh, similar to like hosted Spark, if you will, but it's much more easy to use uh, and it's, it scales really well. So we were able to scale it to like thousands of workers to process you know, petabytes of data within a few minutes. Uh, so that was very practical. And so we built uh, this library to Colterra to make sure that everybody was reusing the same component. So if somebody had to do a particular operation, for example, uh, uh, rotating images or cropping images or, or uh, any sort of like group by certain dimension, like segment time or anything like that, or VIN numbers, then everybody was using the same logic. Uh, so this was a, a success internally. Suddenly teams were uh, having a much easier time accessing data and they spent a lot less time generating data sets and so they could focus more on, um, on iterating on, on models. So this was the first sort of win that we had as, a, as an infrastructure team and that was crucial to establish our credibility within the company because ML engineers and data scientists, typically when you go to them to offer them new tools, they're like, I don't care about your tool, I don't want to adopt something new, I just want my model to get better. Uh, so if you, if you tell them about like traceability, scalability, and so on, they don't really care as much. So it was important to establish our credibility within the org. And then the next uh, challenge we tried to tackle is to enable automation. So Cruz had this pretty ambitious vision at the time uh, that they would you know, collect all this data on the road, all the sensors collecting data all the time. And then when the cars come back to the warehouse, uh, the, the hard drives get offloaded into an ingestion bay, and then uh, you do some data mining to figure out what are the sequences, what are the, the timestamps, the scenes that were problematic, uh, so, so that you can label them and then add them to your uh, training data set, and then the model can you know, train in a more sort of um, tail end of the distributions. 
And so they wanted to do this very automatically so that you know, every two, three weeks, you would have a new model uh, coming out and being shipped to the cars. Uh, and obviously, this requires a lot of automation because this entire process is very, very manual. And so uh, we had to figure out how to enable this. And again, in a way that is sufficiently easy for uh, a workforce of like hundreds of ML engineers to use by themselves without having to offload uh, projects to infrastructure teams. So this is essentially what, what I was talking about, this continuous learning machine. The idea is that you start with this canonical data set, uh, you train a model, you deploy it uh, to, to a car, for example, or you know, this works for any other systems, not necessarily just a car, and it generates inferences. Most of your inferences hopefully are correct. Some of them may be incorrect, and so the tricky part is to identify those incorrect inferences. That's error mining. Once you have those incorrect inferences, so uh, basically it's a model failures, uh, you, you know, get them labeled, uh, by humans and then you add them to your canonical data set and you keep doing this loop over and over again every few weeks uh, so that the model trains more and more in the corners of the parameter space. So we had to build infrastructure that would uh, make this as automated as possible. You still obviously need some humans in, in the loop there, uh, you know, for to, to screen models before they, they come out, uh, like review metrics. You'll also need labelers, but uh, everything else should be ideally automated. Um, so this is a quote by Carl Vought, the founder of Cruise. Uh, when they started launching outside of SF, so they launched in, uh, I think, in Phoenix, uh, Austin, and some other cities. Uh, and essentially because all of those tools, all of those processes were automated, so data ingestion, error mining, training, and so on, they were able to train models for those other cities uh, very easily. They did not have to restart from scratch to basically reuse similar pipelines and pointed to, to new data sets and were able to get the cars to drive well on those, uh, those streets uh, because you know, different states, different cities have different traffic rules, have different weather, different visibility and so on. Uh, so they were able to launch, uh, so every new city that they have to launch in is not as hard as launching in the first city is, is the point. Um, so what do you need to build such kind of a continuous system? Uh, so first, you obviously need to track your inferences. You need to persist every time you make a prediction, whether you have an online system that does recommendation, for example, or any type of machine learning system. You need to persist those inferences alongside some metadata. So you know whatever your users are doing at the time, where you are, what are the circumstances of the inference, what are the features, obviously, of the inference, and so on. Uh, now, once you have that, so you have a set of features and inferences, you need to find a way to identify uh, inferences that are problematic. Obviously, you don't have access to ground truth because uh, this is you know, real production machine learning, so you need to find other ways to identify um, uh, failures. So it could be uh, user behavior, for example, if you're doing a, a recommendation system or a search uh, um, system, uh, if your user don't click on any of your recommendations, obviously something's wrong. Uh, or if your search results are not uh, cl being clicked on, same thing. In the case of Cruise, it was, for example, uh, if a, a test driver uh, would like uh, grab the wheel. That's a, a major signal that something's off. Not necessarily because we trained the, those uh, those drivers to be very conservative. Even if there was no, you know, uh, we, we don't want them to, th to think basically. So that's just one indicator. Another one would be distance to the close closest object on the road. So for example, if you are too close to a uh, a skateboarder or another car, uh, so you can analyze the distributions of those distances and see, well, this is the threshold at which we're comfortable. If it goes below, you can say, okay, well, maybe look, let's look at those, uh, at those scenes. So you need to find those like non-ML ways to, to identify those, uh, those failures. Uh, and then you can use some techniques to auto-label those things. So you can have like simpler models uh, that ju just do one thing is to try to figure out a rough labeling for 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 this scene, and this rough labeling will help a human labeling service. So, for example, if you ask uh, a, a human workforce to label objects, they may, they may take I don't know maybe a minute per uh, per image to to draw bounding boxes. If the bounding boxes are already drawn by a rough model and they only have to adjust them or validate them, it's much faster and much cheaper. So. Uh, you, you, you need to, to set that up. Uh, and then once the data has been labeled, you need to have an automated ingestion pipeline for this labeled data and pass it to your uh, data processing pipeline to convert the data into a, uh, a feature data set so that you can start your training pipelines as well. So all of this needs to be automated, obviously. Um, and then once the model has been trained, evaluation, simulation, and so on, it's also to be automated so that the uh, next thing that humans need to do is to look at uh, metrics and results and decide whether or not a model is, is fit for 
for deployment. Uh, so essentially what I just described is end-to-end -end automation. So from the moment the data leaves the car to the moment it's been being sent to the human labeling workforce to the moment it comes back and then the model is, sh is trained and shipped, all of this needs to be automated without any human intervention. So that takes obviously a lot of infrastructure to, to do this. Uh, so I'm going to go into detail here as to like what kind of jobs specifically are, um, are necessary to do this. So you start with you know, data processing. So you have some raw data sitting in a data warehouse, maybe you know, uh, images, uh, LiDAR point clouds, sound clips, tabular data. You have metadata about the different drives that the cars have been done and so on. Um, so data processing is your first step. Uh, then obviously training evaluation using PyTorch typically. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, I mean, not the jobs, but this, the, the sequence of steps is pretty straightforward. After that, what's really important is a regression test and simulation. So regression test essentially is every time something happens on the road, uh, very much like test-driven development. You know, every time you have a bug, you add the bug to your test suite, then you, you write a bug fix, make sure the test pass, and then you keep this test in your test suite forever to make sure that every time you ship changes, there's no regression in your code base. Uh, so it's very similar here. Every time there's a scene happening on the road that uh, was suboptimal, uh, you add it to your test suite, then you iterate on the model to make sure that uh, uh, in a simulation, in a simulated environment, this um, sort of uncomfortable scene is being resolved. So, for example, there was too close a proximity with another um, sort of uh, object on the road, then you make sure in a simulated environment that this does not, does not, ha does not happen again. And so you keep all those segments of, um, of, of driving in your test suite that grows over time, thousands and thousands of scenes that you have to rerun every time uh, your, your model goes through, through this process. Uh, and simulation as well, as I mentioned, uh, we would have to simulate uh, the outcome you know, based on a real scene. What is the outcome with the updated model? Uh, and this is done in a simulation framework that essentially uses, you know, game engines to simulate, you know, uh, real scenes of, of San Francisco with different lightings, different uh, time of day, different places in the city, and, and so on. Uh, after that, you have a number of steps to uh, optimize your model so that it can run on the on the car. As you can imagine, the hardware that's available on the car is not as powerful as the ones that you can have in uh, in the clouds, for example. It has constrained uh, latency; has to be extremely fast uh, because of the uh, response times that need to be to happen in the car. Um, and uh, also the power consumption uh, is, is limited. So uh, there's a number of techniques to you know, prune your models, to make it lighter, to make or quantize it, for example, uh, to, make it, um, to make it work. And also you have to make sure that it works with a particular GPU that's there on the car. So yeah, those steps also have to be uh, automated. Um, and then metrics review, that's typically the point where a human is going to look at a dashboard and look at all those test results and see whether or not the model uh, first does not regress on any of the prior scenes, but also improves the metrics that you're, uh, that you're looking at. Uh, and eventually, you want to merge your model into your, uh, into your code base and then deploy it to the car. Uh, so once that's done, uh, you, you know, the car drives around and then comes back uh, at the end of the day, and that's when you ingest the, the sensor data and you do error mining, uh, then you do, do auto labeling and you send it to labeling workforce. Uh, the labeling workforce is going to label data, obviously, and then return it to you, and then this, you close the loop. So this requires you know, many different systems and backends. You know, a data processing cluster is not the same as a training cluster. Uh, the simulation framework runs on a different type of, um, of backend as well. So all those things need to be orchestrated. Um, so uh, all those things here can be automated. You can have some handoffs between those different steps. You can standardize the way that data is being passed, that uh, metadata is being tracked between all those jobs. Uh, those other aspects, though, obviously require human intervention. So you always need to have uh, a scientist look at the, the metrics uh, or some human look at the metrics before you decide uh, to, to ship it out. And same thing on the other side, you also need to have humans labeling your, um, your content. Um, but everything else can be uh, as automated as possible. So 
things that you need to automate this, uh, one thing that we uh, we built in is something we call lineage tracking. Um, the idea is that it's a complete, a complete knowledge graph of all the assets that went into your your uh, your pipeline. So this is an example. Uh, in orange here, you can see different jobs, so data processing, model training, and so on. You need to track everything that goes with it. So the configuration of your training job, the raw data that was used, so you know to be able to exactly reproduce the same results. So uh, exactly the uh, the, the rows in your tables that are being used and so on. Um, who is so the owner of the code that is running, the, the code that is running itself, the logs of this of this job, all of this needs to be persisted and linked back to the, the final outcome. So the final outcome in this case would be a trained model that is ready to go out to the car. It's important that you have a database somewhere where this model idea ID is is linked to all those other assets so that you can easily debug all the way back up to the, the raw data. Uh, if something happens on the road, you should be able to go back in your, in your database and be like, okay, this is the job that trained the model, this is the input data set, this is the configuration we used, these are the resource, the cloud resources we used, like what type of GPUs and so on. So this is important for a number of reasons. Uh, traceability, obviously, you know, you want to know what you did so that you can uh, reproduce it and, and debug it. Uh, but an even more important aspect is compliance because especially in a, a safety critical uh, product like, like Cruise, and you know, it was in the news recently, uh, as, as you may have heard, uh, law enforcement is entitled to ask, do you have full custody of your assets? Can you reproduce these results? Can you prove uh, who, that there was no nefarious influence on the model? And so if you don't have a database that links back your final product to so your, your model and your inferences all the way to all the individual pieces of data, configuration, code that were used to produce this outcome, you may be in trouble. So uh, it may be less important if, if your product is not safety critical, but in general, I think it's a it's good practice to have this exhaustive lineage tracking. Um, so another aspect that's pretty important is full tolerance. As you can imagine, those long automated pipelines, they can run for multiple days. Uh, sometimes even just the training part can last seven days. Uh, we've had jobs um, uh, running that long. And so it's pretty common to have failures in cloud environments. Uh, you know, it could be uh, database failures, could be timeouts, could be, you know, external services are down, uh, any or your Kubernetes nodes are being preempted for whatever reason. And so if you don't have a way to recover automatically from those failures, then most of your jobs are going to fail. You're going to waste a lot of compute power. You're going to waste a lot of human power. And so it's important to be able to recover from, uh, from, from those things. So like, you know, timeouts, every time you query, uh, an API or, or fetch a file from like GCS, S3 or whatever, you should obviously uh, have to uh, be able to recover from that, network errors, uh, no preemptions, you know, third party services are down and so on. So the way to mitigate those things is first of all, well, we try everything, you know, that's pretty, the, the first thing you want to do every time you have a failure, uh, you try to, you know, you wait a few seconds and retry. So like automated retries everywhere. Uh, anytime you have to fetch something remotely, you have to have some, some retry mechanism. Uh, then you need to persist uh, checkpoints as, as frequently as possible, whether it's data processing checkpoints when you have a long data processing job or when you have a long training job, uh, you know, as often as possible, you persist a checkpoint so that you can implement warm restarts. So the idea of a warm restart is that maybe your, your job has been training for like a couple hours uh, and so you've been persisting uh, checkpoints in cloud storage and obviously not on your node in case the node go, uh, goes away. Uh, and so your job can be restarted and instead of, tra of training from scratch again, it starts training from the last checkpoint. So you can automate this so that the end users, the ML engineers don't have to implement those by themselves is if the framework itself takes care of that. It means that um, uh, job failures are kind of even fairly transparent parents to users, they don't even know that they're happening, and the jobs will just uh, proceed from the last checkpoint. So that's, that's pretty important. Uh, caching is also very important because, uh, let's say you're iterating on your um, training evaluation pipeline, and so you have a training job and an evaluation job, and you're iterating on the evaluation part, you obviously don't want to have to, re to repeat the training job. Obviously, you could you know extract the evaluation job and just run it by, himself, uh, by itself on the 
um, on, on the final model checkpoint. But if your entire pipeline has the right caching implemented, you can blindly rerun the pipeline and the steps that haven't changed, the same input, same code should basically not rerun. They should just use a cached uh, output. And so can, that can dramatically accelerate the, the rates of experimentation uh, within your, your um, ML teams if you have this, the, this, this, those types of, uh, of systems. Um, and then finally, once all the failures that will not be able to be automatically caught or retried are, are self-healed, uh, you need to obviously log them, track them, what is the, the root cause of the, of the failure, and then sort them by the most impactful, the most expensive, or whatever metric it is that you're trying to minimize, and then address them one by one, obviously. And so build um, fault tolerance around those particular um, issues. Uh, so the next thing that is important for those automation to work is observability. Um, so if you don't have logs of your jobs or if, if your logs are not being persisted, then you don't know what the failures are. Uh, so persisting logs uh, in a way that can be you know, browsed through easily by your ML teams is important. Failures, exceptions, for example, Python exceptions, if it happens at the you know, 200 pages log, uh, it's very hard for somebody to debug that. So if you can automatically extract your Python exception, store them in the DB or somewhere else, and then show them in, a, in, a, in the UI, uh, then it means that your, the ML engineers can quickly see what the failure is and fix it as opposed to spending half a day uh, scrolling through logs. Um, infrastructure failures, obviously, you also need to have uh, visibility into that. Uh, so that means having some observability at the infrastructure level. Uh, you know, resource usage, for example, like GPU utilization is important because GPUs cost a lot of money. And so you, and, and also jobs are, are slower if you don't utilize the, the entire GPU. So uh, you want to make sure you track those things so that you can um, investigate the, the cause of the, uh, of low utilization and, and optimize that. So all those things have to be tracked and, and available for, for review. Then another aspect that we try to optimize is for iterative de development. Uh, so the idea of, of uh, iterative development is that somebody should be able to make changes on their local machine, so whether they develop on their laptop or on a dev box. So make changes to logic, training code, hyperparameters, input data, whatever it is that they are trying to iterate on, uh, run it on their local machine on a small amount of data to validate that uh, the code is correct, that there's no major failure failures, and then very easily scale this job out to a cloud cluster without having to go through a lengthy deployment process of like, you know, uh, getting a PR review, merging the PR, getting through a CI CD pipeline to produce, uh, you know, um, a container assets and then deploying it to a cluster. All of this takes way too much time. Ideally, the user makes a, a code change on a laptop, then they, co they call a, a submission command line and that packages their local environments, so their, their local code, their local dependencies, their libraries and ships it to the cluster right away without having to go through, uh, of course, for, for production pipelines, you need to go through you know, code review and PR and, and so on. But as you're iterating, you need to be able to quickly just launch a job from your laptop. Um, so that's uh, actually not trivial because you know packaging local code can take a while and uh, there's many uh, different aspects that need to be taken into account, especially at Cruise, uh, the, the code that runs on the car is C++, and sometimes we would uh, use PyBind to expose C++ code to Python pipelines, which means that if you make a change on the C++ side at, at runtime, when the user submits the, jo the job, you need to compile and build the C++ library, link them, and then expose them to PyBind for the Python code. So all of this needs to happen at runtime whenever the, users, the user submits uh, their, their pipeline. So back at Cruise, we used to use Bazel. Maybe some of you have heard of Bazel. It's a build system coming out of, of Google. I think it was called Blaze when it was at, at Google. And the idea is that every library, every piece of code is represented by a build target. And so you can use Bazel to automate this entire process that automatically detects, detects the changes that you have on your local machine, will rebuild and recompile those things and build the corresponding Docker image and then push it to a remote registry and start the job. Um, so a lot of different pieces of, of technology goes into this, but from a, use, from a user's perspective, they essentially call a command line to submit a job, and depending on you know, the, the magnitude of the change, within a few minutes, uh, the image is built, shipped, and the job starts on the remote cluster. And then the other side of uh, iterative development is that uh, when 
the, the job has completed, the results should be readily viewable in the UI. So uh, we don't want users to have to store their own plots <coughs> on S3, for example, or have to download any assets into a local notebook. They should be able to go in the UI, click on the job, view the, the plots, the metrics, the visualizations that they're looking at, uh, they, that they produce during their job, without having to do any, any additional work. Um, so this was pretty important, uh, and uh, it worked pretty well um, over there. So. Um, I was. I hope I was able to convince you that this kind of continuous ML um, processes are important to keep models up to date and fresh, and you know pick up on new trends. Uh, this was, for example, particularly important uh, during COVID. When COVID started, many models became irrelevant because they didn't pick up on the latest trends. You know, people were staying at home, ordering more online. Uh, and I'm, here I'm talking about ML in general, not just not just crews. Uh, so basically, whenever there are changes in the underlying data, the model needs to be updated. And so if you don't have a very streamlined process to just almost click a button and get your model refreshed and, and, and have metrics, then you're going to spend weeks you know, catching up to trends, and it's really not scalable. And so the way to do this is to have this end-to-end -end automation built into your, your MLOps platform, and that requires all those, um, those uh, kind of aspects that I described in, in this talk. Um, so that's kind of what we built at Cruise, and it really enables uh, to move much faster um, and so that's uh, the obligatory self-promotion slide at the end of the talk uh, where the idea for Semantic, which is the company that uh, we started after Cruise, um, was that we would build this into an open source product that we could um, uh, sell to or, or let others use essentially. Uh, so we basically took all those learnings that we got from uh, all this time at Cruise and we tried to build it into this open source product uh, that is available out there, free to use, it works very well on your local machine, don't even have to deploy anything. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that is the idea. And that's it for me. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, happy hour, I think, is soon. <laughs> we can also talk there. <laughs> yes? TRT conversion. Um, so um, I think there was um, a NVIDIA um, uh, library to compress models and uh, to make models smaller and hold uh, in memory uh, better. I think that they actually just released a version for LLM. I think it's called TRT LLM or LLM TRT. I think it's a combination of pruning, quantization, or different optimization techniques that are wrapped into a library so that uh, models can run on smaller devices. It's especially important for LLMs because they're so huge um, that, um, yeah. 